Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 93, December 26th to December 31st, 1862. Before I get going, just want to wish everybody a very happy new year as we're closing in on 2023 and 1863. And it's, uh, it's hard to imagine, but appreciate you all being on this journey here and look forward to seeing you all next year as well. Last week, we discussed several events out in Mississippi. The USS Cairo was sunk by a torpedo, as well as a raid on the supply depot at Holly Springs. I very briefly mentioned as well that Nathan Bedford Forrest is operating in an attempt to disrupt the Union supply lines. So it is not just Earl Van Dorn, but his action in concert with Van Dorn is wreaking havoc in the Union rear area. They're tearing up telegraph wire, as well as capturing and destroying supplies. So they are making it very difficult for offensive action to continue into Mississippi toward Vicksburg. William T. Sherman and his expeditionary force have been defeated at Chickasaw Bluffs, seeing his retreat and John McClernand soon arriving to take command. Remember that McClernand's troops had been essentially hijacked by William T. Sherman and Grant. You probably signs off on that in that they don't like McClernand and McClernand is the ranking subordinate under Grant, so when he gets there, he's going to be taking command. This week, we are going to begin the Battle of Stones River by starting that campaign and battle. Conveniently, it was fought on December 31st and January 1st, so we're going to break it up and hopefully make two more palatable episodes than the longer ones we usually do, for the larger size battles. Before we do that, just want to have a quick announcement here, though. We did post the part one of Gods and Generals, the movie review, and pretty shortly we're actually going to be posting part two. So we'll have the second half of that review. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, as well as the numerous memoir reviews, uh, we have a couple picture slideshows showing the modern day battlefields of some of the sites we've talked about. If any of that sounds interesting, there is a link to the Patreon in the show description, so your support for the show is greatly appreciated. Without further ado, though, let's head to Tennessee. To begin, we need to talk just a little bit about the situation in this theater as we left things following the Battle of Perryville. Braxton Bragg's army withdrew to Chattanooga, Bragg himself traveling to see the rebel president so that he could lay out his plan to retain Tennessee. It should be noted that Kirby Smith and Leonidas Polk also talked things over with their friend Jefferson Davis, and it would not surprise you to know that they did not have good things to say about their superior Bragg. While Smith will not be with the Army of Tennessee for long, Polk, importantly, would be tasked with reporting on the situation back to Richmond, because obviously, if you're going to talk to Bragg about that, everything is going to be sunshine and roses, right? So they need more accurate assessment of what's really going on on the ground, and keep that in mind, because that's something we're going to get into more next week. Bragg's 45,000-man army would be reduced to around 37,000, with Carter Stevenson's division being sent to Pemberton as part of the defense of Vicksburg. Thus, the army would be set up in a three-corps-type system, with Kirby Smith being reassigned. It would also sap some much-needed strength from Bragg's army. This is something that we're going to talk about probably a little bit more in depth as we get into 1863, but there's a thought by the Jefferson Davis administration that if you just shuffle troops around to meet the greatest threat, 
you can kind of play the shell game and eventually you'll be able to stem the tide of any kind of union offensive. But what happens if there's a joint offensive in all theaters? That's going to be a real problem, right? Confederate forces would be situated around Murfreesboro, spread out and ready for the winter. This was part of the plan to successfully occupy Middle Tennessee, advancing from Chattanooga and Knoxville. Unfortunately for the rebels, though, there would be the Joint Federal Offensive to gain support for the Emancipation Proclamation, solidifying that announcement as it would come out in 1863. For the Union Army, remember we have a new commanding officer in what will be dubbed the Army of the Cumberland in early 1863. William Rosecrans will arrive replacing Buell, who is finally discarded, having been unable to capitalize falling Perryville. After the victory at Corinth, and also a tuffle with Grant, we might add, Rosecrans will get the billing. Now, Rosecrans is an interesting figure, because he does do a good job in changing the Union forces. Their lack of discipline was well documented in the Perryville campaign. If you remember, there were accounts of Indiana recruits being allowed to swim across the Ohio to their home state. Likewise, there were also reports of rampant drinking upon gaining Louisville. The new commanding general would set out to impart discipline, but also ingratiate himself with his troops, making connections, whereas his predecessor did not. We are going to see there is an emphasis on his presence on the battlefield, a sharp contrast when Buell misses Perryville entirely. One officer Rosecrans needed to win over immediately, though, was George Thomas. Thomas considered Rosecrans his junior and probably expected to receive command of the army, declining back in the fall during the Kentucky campaign. While originally ticked off, Thomas would be soothed by Rosecrans and the changing of commission date for the avowed Catholic Rosecrans, who would then be rightfully his superior. Remember, there's a lot of red tape involved in the army, especially the Civil War armies, so it is deemed unacceptable by Thomas that Rosecrans has, even if they're the same rank, he has a less of a commission date. So technically Thomas would outrank him, but then once the date is changed and everything is hunky-dory from then on out. Thomas would rather, though, be a wing, or equivalently a corps commander, as opposed to the second-in-command of the army. Remember, Buell had made him this kind of weird second-in-command position. Regardless, though, Rosecrans would lean on his subordinate, referring to him as a valuable resource. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the composition of the armies. Not a whole lot has changed since Perryville, but there has been some shuffling. Thomas, as mentioned, would command the five-division center wing, but some of these divisions were detached. He did have veteran commanders, you may remember, from previous episodes in Lovell Rousseau and Speedsmith Fry, as well as James Negley. Negley was a Pittsburgh native who had seen action in the Mexican-American War as a volunteer. He will serve in Congress after the conflict. His division included a brigade under James Gallant Spears, who was a Tennessee Loyalist, two of his regiments being from that state. Nagley's 2nd Brigade had the 18th Illinois, which included some companies who were formerly Ellsworth's cadets. You remember Elmer Ellsworth, of course, and his Zouave cadets. Rousseau would have a 4th Brigade, made up entirely of U.S. Army regulars, as well as his veteran brigade under Starkweather and another under politician John Beatty. Alexander McCook had some familiar names in his right wing, 
Jefferson C. Davis was restored to command, and he has Philip Sheridan as well. Richard Johnson commands his 2nd Division, recently returned, having been captured by John Hunt Morgan. Johnson has August Villick in his division, as well as Quaker Edward Kirk, and future Medal of Honor recipient and Illinois Congressman Philip Post. Sheridan has Joshua Sill, Frederick Schaefer, and George Roberts as his brigade commanders. Jefferson C. Davis has William Carlin, who, if you remember, wanted to break the Confederates apart with the capture of the town of Perryville during that battle. Carlin has Hans Christian Haig and his Scandinavian regiment. Remember, Haig is a very important figure in terms of the Republican cause, he does a good job of recruiting individuals to join the army. We talked about those 48ers as revolutionaries who, who join up uh, having recently immigrated from Europe. Crittenden's left wing has divisions under Thomas Wood, John Palmer, and Horatio Van Cleve. Wood has brigades under Indiana Republican George Day Wagner and Charles Harker a New Jersey native and West Point graduate. Palmer has veterans Charles Cruft and William Babcock Hazen under him, as well as the lawyer and politician from Ohio, William Groves. Rosecrans will also have a Pioneer Brigade put together by James St. Clair Morton. David S. Stanley, who you might remember from the Second Battle at Corinth, was commanding the cavalry. The Confederates would revert to an old two-corps setup with Polk and Hardy as the commanders. Polk's division commanders were Benjamin Cheatham and John Withers. Withers was a West Point graduate and served under Bragg since Pensacola. Cheatham has the same majority Tennessee suspects we talked about at Perryville, Donaldson, Stewart, Manny, and Preston Smith. Withers will have Chalmers and his Mississippi Brigade, John Loomis and his Alabama Brigade, James Patton Anderson, the politician from Mississippi, and Arthur Manigault and his Alabama Brigade. I'm not 100% sure if that's exactly how you pronounce that, but it's phonetically sort of how it looks. But anyway, uh, Manigault was a South Carolina native and had served as a volunteer in the war with Mexico. In Hardy's Corps, we have Breckenridge, Claiborne, and McCowan, who you remember from Island Number 10. Breckenridge has Roger Hansen, nicknamed Old Flintlock, and his orphan brigade from Kentucky. He also has Daniel Adams, William Preston, Gideon Pello, and John King Jackson, a former Georgia lawyer who has already been in our story, participating in the battle on Santa Rosa Island. Claiborne has St. John Little, Bushrod Johnson, Sterling Wood, and Lucius Polk. Polk was a North Carolina native, but moved to Helena, Arkansas, and will serve in the Western Theater until his discharge. Lucius was also the nephew of Bishop Polk, and had originally enlisted as a private in the 15th Arkansas, where Patrick Claiborne was originally a captain. McCowan has Matthew Ector, who is a Texas lawyer, commanding dismounted Texas cavalry, James Edwards Raines, a Tennessee native, Yale graduate and former employee of Felix Zollicoffer, and Evander McNair, who had served in the 1st Mississippi Rifles during the Mexican-American War. Cavalry, as we have mentioned, is under Joseph Wheeler, who has under him a Virginian John Pegram and John Wharton, who you will remember from Terry's Texas Rangers, the 8th Texas, a unit that Nathan Bedford Forrest was extremely irritated at the transfer to be under 
Wheeler's control. Rosecrans would begin the campaign by advancing his three corps on three different roads. I know technically they are wings, but I am going to call them corps because that is essentially what they are. Thomas, McCook, and Crittenton would take different routes, all converging on Murfreesboro. Along the way, they would run into skirmishers from Wheeler and Wharton, who would gradually give ground. Criticism has been placed on Joe Wheeler, who was new to command at this level. Remember, Bragg had ticked off Forrest by appointing Wheeler, who it should be noted was definitely more agreeable than the hot-tempered Forrest. If Bragg had adequately used Forrest and John Hunt Morgan, then things might have been different. Meanwhile, on the other side, there were concerns with the lack of quality from the Federal Cavalry. In some instances, the Cavalry was not in position to screen the infantry advance, but it would still work out for the columns. Rosecrans believed that Bragg would eventually take up a defensive position along Sawyer's Creek and be ready to receive the enemy, but the Confederates were sort of spread out. Remember that if you're going into winter encampment, you want to be a little bit spread out in terms of foraging, right? If your army is operating in an area for a long time, you do want to be a little bit more condensed to maybe receive supply, but still kind of spread out. So they are spread out, it being winter. Hardy's men would be faced directly with McCook's advancing column, but they would withdraw at the consolidated position with the rest of the army. Skirmishing would continue outside of Murfreesboro around the Smith House, which will be on the battlefield. Rosecrans would arrive, but his full force of some 45,000 would not be assembled until December 30th. Bragg, on the other hand, would sit and wait for an attack that's never going to materialize. Now we do need to talk about the terrain of the battlefield picked out by Bragg. Overall, it was a poor position. In fact, Murfreesboro in general was a poor location for any kind of defensive line because of all these roads that could be used to approach. It would be easily flanked if the Union forces felt so inclined. There were better positions that the army could have adopted for defense, and it could have also provided a grasp on Middle Tennessee which would also allow for the supplies that the army needed to come in. But in December 1862, there was Bragg's army, partially divided by Stones River around Murfreesboro. On the right flank, and in the wrong spot on the other side of the river, we have Breckenridge, with Hardy and Polk occupying the center and left. A plan would be formulated to attack rather than invite the Yankees to do so first. Hardy would begin a sweeping flank movement, which would be followed by the units in the center, much the same strategy that Bragg had employed at Perryville. Remember, we talked about that Bragg loves attacking in echelon, which is essentially what is going to happen here. Breckenridge would remain where he was and be thrown in for support if necessary. December 31st would mark the date for the assault. On the other side of the field, Rosecrans would also begin developing a plan of his own, his army finally assembled. Much in the same way that Bragg hoped to exploit his extended left flank, Rosecrans would exploit the isolated Breckenridge, McCook standing firm while Thomas and Crittenden assaulted the Confederate right and center. Unfortunately for Rosecrans, though, Bragg would beat him to the punch. On the night of the 30th, the two lines would duel with bands, each playing tunes. Eventually, both sides would play the tune Home Sweet Home before silence descended on the field. Each side contemplated what the next day would bring. A little after 6 a.m. on December 31st, the Confederate attack would begin, simply rising earlier than the Federals. Richard Johnson's division would be the first in line of fire for the advancing mass of butternut troops. 
McCowan's division with Reigns, Ector, and McNair would be leading the way, followed by Claiborne's division trailing behind them. Edward Kirk's line was flawed in that some regiments would not have a clear field of fire. August Villick's men were mostly on a kind of parallel deployment facing west and to the north of Kirk. Richard Johnson was not an experienced commander, which explains how the rebels are able to get the jump on him, his men not properly prepared. There were accounts of Union dead still holding coffee cups. The Confederate advance was so rapid. Kirk's line would evaporate very quickly when facing the determined advance. Canister fire would do some damage, but would not stop the massive men. Supporting regiments would also collapse from Kirk's line, Vilk's men not putting up too much of a resistance either. Kirk would actually be hit in the leg and captured. Despite being paroled, he would eventually die from complications associated with the wound. Vilk would be captured as he rode to try to rally his men by Ector's Texans. At times, the retreat would be panicked, men from Ohio running into a fence that would trap them temporarily. The men either frantically tried to dismantle the obstacle or surrendered to the oncoming rebels. Baldwin's brigade, combined with Sydney Post's from Jefferson Davis's division, would set up a resistance against Claiborne's division. Problems were developing for the attacking forces, though, because Reigns and Ector were being taken in a westward direction, pursuing the retreating Yankees. This was taking them away from their flanking mission and losing cohesion with the rest of the rebel line. McNair and St. John Little would be able to concentrate an attack on Baldwin, who would withdraw. Bushrod Johnson dealing with postmen and some pesky artillery. William Carlin and his brigade would cause some trouble for Claiborne's remaining brigade under Lucius Polk by setting up defensively in a thick cedar forest. From there, the Federals were able to briefly stand against their enemy before pulling back. In fact, the Northern forces were finding it difficult to rally because the right always seemed to crumble. Eventually, the line would start to be formed on the Wilkerson Turnpike. The Confederate attack was starting to lose a bit of momentum, some of the brigades having to stop and replenish their ammunition. It's around this time that John Wharton and his Confederate cavalry made an attempt on the ammunition train of McCook. Wharton's orders from Bragg were to get around into the rear and generally cause havoc, capturing whatever enemy stores that he could. His gray-clad riders came very close to securing this train, but well-timed charges from Minor Milliken of the 1st Ohio and a cobbled-together force from Division Commander John Kennett would save the wagons. Colonel Milliken was actually killed in the saber charge against the Southerners. Brigade Commander Louis Zam would actually write that things were looking pretty blue in regards to how close the rebels came to succeeding. Special consideration was given to Captain Gates Thurston, who was in command of the ammunition train, and managed to eventually get it to safety. But where was Cavalry Commander David Stanley, you might ask? Well, he had been sent to secure a different train, and was reportedly enjoying a drink with a fellow officer. It's not a good look for the new Cavalry Commander. Speaking of drinking, let's talk about Benjamin Cheatham and his assault on Sheridan in the center of the Union line. Now I say drinking because Cheatham was reported to have been drunk during the battle, or just otherwise overly aggressive. This is not necessarily anything new for Cheatham, but he's usually accused of being drunk during these battles, and maybe he was, but regardless of whether he was intoxicated or not, he did not deploy his brigades very well. Instead of attacking, turning on the right wheel, as Bragg had instructed, there was no coordination. They were thrown against the enemy piecemeal. It would begin with the Alabamians under Loomis, who would attack against William Woodruff 
of Jefferson Davis Division and Joshua Sill of Sheridan's Division. Loomis would see some success, but would eventually be repulsed by inflating fire from the Yankee line. Alfred Vaughn would be the next to attack, the 9th Texas, in an incredible moment, actually fighting alone against the Northerners, finding themselves in a wedge against the men of Woodruff and Carlin. In these attacks, General Sill was killed, the brigade taken by Pea Ridge veteran Nicholas Grusel. Manigault and Manny's brigade would hit the Union line next, but Colonel George Roberts would deploy his men along with artillery against the attacking rebels. Mangalt and Manny would suffer casualties against the determined federal defense. Sheridan, meanwhile, would be forced to reshuffle, pulling his men into a cedar and limestone position. At this point, the line was starting to look like an inverted triangle, with Robert's brigade at the point. Patton Anderson's brigade of Withers' division for the Confederates would have no luck in dislodging the strong Yankee position on the line. Roberts of Sheridan's division had made quite a strong position out of the limestone formations. This area I actually hope to highlight with a photo on the website. Let it be known, though, that Sheridan's men were not alone on this line, as it should be pointed out that James Negley of the center wing under George Thomas was also adding to this delay in the Confederate attack. While the attacks were coming piecemeal, these were easily repulsed but soon the Yankees would run low on ammunition. Alexander Stewart, who we introduced in previous battles, would form a concentrated strike with the entirety of his brigade along with support. Roberts would be killed and his men broken. The blood from killed and wounded would get into the cracks of the limestone, causing the Chicago men to remark it was reminiscent of a slaughterhouse. Moving forward, this part of the battlefield would be known as the Slaughter Pen. One of Negley's brigades, under Timothy Stanley, would take on heavy casualties from Confederate artillery, which is probably one of the only times on the day an attack was supported in such a way by the Confederates. As Roberts broke, Rosecrans was scrambling to build a new defensive line along the Nashville Turnpike. Despite his shortcomings and his habit of contradicting orders and being at times incoherent, Rosecrans was present on the battlefield, something noted by many in their writings. If you recall that Rosecrans had kind of like this excited stutter in these high-pressure situations, um, so it, sometimes it was hard to understand exactly what he was looking to have done if you were a subordinate officer, so... That's what we're talking about in terms of this contradicting of orders. So close to the fighting was he that at one point a member of his staff was beheaded by a rebel artillery. The Union forces would set up a horseshoe-shaped line under the direction of their commander, with attention still paid to the other side of Stones River, where Breckenridge and his division were. There was a real opportunity from Breckenridge to potentially take advantage of crossing the river at a place called McFadden's Ford, and possibly breaking the entire Union line. Many of the units slated for the assault on the Confederate right were redirected, opening up space for such a move. Bragg and Breckenridge would drop the ball here. So often, you see from these commanders, I'd like to point out that there are those who take the initiative and there are those who are sort of letter to the law by their orders. And regardless of whether your commanding officer sees the advantage, uh, some of the officers that we consider good general officers are going to take advantage of an opportunity like this. That's not to say that Breckenridge wasn't a good commander. I think he was more middle of the road than anything. But you got a guy like, say, Stonewall Jackson in the east. He's able to anticipate that this is what Robert E. Lee would want to, to do, and he's able to effectively take advantage of a situation like this. Whereas, and maybe this is just because I've been doing a lot of research for, for Gettysburg, that you have Richard Ewell, who's a good soldier, but 
he needs to be actually told what to do. So he's not going to necessarily take advantage of a situation that's going to supersede his order. So this is a kind of an interesting contrast we have in these, these officers during these battles. Claiborne and McCowan would continue their attack, having moved through the left flank, stopping to rest and resupply. Reigns would be the first Confederate commander to see the new Nashville Turnpike Line, and unfortunately for him, it would be the last thing he would see as he is killed in the attempt forward. His brigade had gone unsupported, Claiborne still worried at Union forces who would potentially fall on his flank. Rosecrans had infantry and several pieces of artillery ready to meet the rebels. In addition, he had assigned officers to collect fugitives from Johnson's division and reform them as a reserve. William Babcock Hazen and his brigade of Palmer's division in Crittenden's wing would set up in a position along the Nashville Turnpike near the intersection of that pike and another road connecting to the Wilkerson Turnpike, known as Round Forest. Now, Round Forest is not round. It is actually square, and this area will soon be known as another name, Hell's Half Acre. Hazen would be at the very tip of the horseshoe at this spot. Cruft's brigade would be forced to withdraw, having been engaged with the oncoming rebels in the Cedars along with a brigade from William Gross. Further north along the pike, Lovell Rousseau was filling out the new Union position, but Rosecrans needed time. Oliver Shepard's brigade of regulars from his division had been engaged earlier in the day, but they would be called in again to protect Cruft and Gross as they fell back. Thomas would order Shepard simply to go and stop the rebels. Bravely, the regulars re-entered the forest, but the enemy outnumbered them and were able to flank their lines. Twenty minutes is what the regulars bought in terms of time for the Federals, and it came at a cost of 400 casualties, but 20 minutes was enough to save the withdrawing units and allow for Hazen and Milo Haskell to prepare. Crude breastworks were made with whatever material was at hand. Additionally, the regulars had torn up the command of A.P. Stewart. Assaults would begin on this part of the line, but they were all repulsed. The 8th Tennessee would suffer 68% casualties in their attempt to dislodge the Federals. Breckenridge would be ordered to send his brigades across the river to join in the carnage. Now, Breckenridge had reported that he was surely going to be under attack earlier in the day. While Van Cleve had moved his division across the ford, remember it was the Union intention to attack the Confederate right, they had withdrawn back across the river, a fact Breckenridge may not have been aware of. At any rate, Adams' brigade and that of John Jackson both did little but suffer casualties against the concentrated line. William Preston and Joseph Palmer both aborted a final attempt to take the Round Forest, realizing that their efforts were going to be futile. The new Federal line had held on the left. On the Federal right flank, the battle very well could have been won if the Rebels just had fresh troops available. While McCowan's brigades attacked piecemeal and were repulsed, Claiborne had a golden opportunity. The Pioneer Brigade, which included the Chicago Board of Trade Artillery, named as such because that is who financed their creation, had been thrown into the line, showing you how it was very much every man on deck at this point. But Claiborne would not be facing these men. St. John Little was able to outflank the enemy line, finding himself in a situation, along with Bushrod Johnson, where they were facing only one brigade under Charles Harker, detached from Haskell's, formerly Wood's, division, the latter being wounded. Harker had actually moved his men to high ground, exposing James Fife's brigade. Had the rebels turned in on their enemy, they could have made a real problem for Rosecrans. But a determined effort by the Northerners, which included a bayonet charge by the only available regiments who had run out of ammunition, put the Southern boys to flight. Overall, we can say that the Confederate attack on the 31st was 
initially successful in that it turned the Union right flank, and Rosecrans was able to establish a new defensive line that at various points there were opportunities to break by the Rebels. So Bragg could have had a pretty big victory here, but for a variety of factors, these opportunities are not taken. You know, obviously, the Union defenders probably have something to say about that. So there was a determined defense by several units, and the attack ultimately sputters out. So there's not really a whole lot to show for it at the end of the day. So with that, we will call it an episode. Darkness would end the action on the 31st, with Bragg failing to exploit his early success. Rosecrans had held the Federal line along the Nashville Turnpike. Next week, we will return for the conclusion of the Battle of Stones River, also called Murfreesboro. Once again, I want to say just Happy New Year to everyone, and I look forward to seeing everyone in 2023. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>